Word of God tells us that we are to put on the new man. We talked about some of that in Sunday school this morning. We are to put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God for the express purpose of we're going to have some battles in our lives. Battles that um, it's going to take some special weapons. So we need to be prepared for battles and prepared for things that come against us. And we've talked about some of that a couple of weeks ago and a week before that maybe. But um, I, I do want us this morning to go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I want us to read verse 4 again. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of God. Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that it is anointed. We ask you to anoint us today, our mouths to speak, our ears to hear, and clarity of speech. And we give you the thanks for all of these things in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. What is a stronghold? Actually, it's used here as a metaphor. You uh, English uh, people uh, know what a metaphor is. It's a figure of speech, I understand. It's something that uh, you do as a comparison of one thing to another. And actually, in this particular case here in verse 4, that's what he's, Paul is using this as a figure of speech. So we need to understand what a stronghold is. Actually, in the Word of God... It's referred to different times in the Old Testament, New Testament. It's referred to more as a fortress, a uh, refuge, if you will. Um, it's also defined as an area, a stronghold, a fortress, a refuge. can be an area that is occupied. Somebody said, well, is a stronghold a person? Not exactly. It's more a place than a person. Now, there's people in that place that make up the stronghold, but a stronghold is a place. I want you to understand that this morning. And it's a place that is occupied. It wouldn't be a stronghold if it wasn't occupied. And also, it's a place that's dominated. There's domination in a stronghold. It's dominated by a group. It can be a special group, a specific group. In fact, the Apostle Paul here, writing to the church at Corinth in his second letter, uh, they tell me that Corinth had a place that was a fortress within their city. It was a, a refuge for people to go uh, a lot of things went on in the city of Corinth. We understand there was a lot of ungodly things. It was a very industrious city. So, yes, Corinth had a fortress. So Paul used this metaphor, if you will, to explain to them uh, that this stronghold he was talking about here, that they could relate it with their own place of, or a fortress. Now, also... You can think of a fortress in this uh, context. A fortress is considered a place of security. 
if you are running from something. Uh, I, I remember one time me and a friend of mine, um, we were down in a river bottom and uh, they was a big mean bull got after us. And uh, it was along the Kings River Bluff over here in southeast Berry County. So uh, we knew where there was a cave. Guess what? Me and my brother Jerry run into that cave. Amen. That was a place of refuge against this angry bull that was after us. So you can see it's a place of security. It can be a place of safety. Have you found safety in very many places in this world? Well, also it can be a harbor of rest. You know the, the song, I anchored my soul in the haven of rest or a harbor. The anchor holds, amen, I'm here, I'm safe in the arms of God. So that's what a, a fortress can also be or a stronghold. Now I understand, we'll get to it in a little bit, the stronghold that Paul was talking about here is not the one you want to be in. I want to make that plain right now. So it's a harbor. It's a place uh, of rest. Now, uh, these things, whether it be a secure place, whether it be uh, a safe place, or a place where you can find rest for your weary soul, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest unto your soul. So, uh, God has a place of rest for His people. I truly believe that. But these things that I just mentioned here concerning a fortress is attributes of God and they are attributes of those who trust in God. Now, uh, a place of security makes no uh, benefit to you if you don't trust in it. Right? Right? If you don't occupy it, if you don't come into it, it won't benefit you anything. The storms of life will still get to you. Now, one of the scriptures that uh, has to do this is found in the book of Nahum. Nahum chapter uh, 1 and uh, verse 7, where he says this, The Lord is good. Now, I could think on that all day long. And you should too. The Lord is good. And people say, well, how, how much of the time? Well, all the time the Lord is good. Amen? True statement. Um, but then after it says, the Lord is good, He is also, this is King James Version here, by the way, He is a strong hold. H-O-L-D. He is a strong hold. Hold in day of trouble. Mm. Have you ever found that to be the case? And he knoweth them that trust in him. Think about it. Isn't that a beautiful scripture? He is a stronghold. Amen? So let me tell you something. There is a place that we need to be where God has a strong hold on us. Mm -hmm. Amen. We, we, we don't need slippery salvations. Amen. We, we need to lay hold on eternal life. Amen. Have a life grip on it, if you will. Lay hold on it. And then let God take care of the rest. Hallelujah. So this is... Uh, attribute here. It's much like this. You find in the uh, Gospel of St. John, chapter 10, where Jesus talking about, you know, Himself being the Good Shepherd. The, he is the Great Shepherd. He's the Good Shepherd. But it's like uh, sheep trust in the Good Shepherd. That's how we ought to be, church. We ought to trust in the good shepherd, because, you know, the psalmist, Psalms chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then he takes care of me. 
I don't want because He takes care of me. Hallelujah. What a relationship between the Good Shepherd and His sheep. Now, in the book of Psalms, I want to read one verse of Scripture there before we go on. In the book of Psalms chapter 9, and also verse 9, I believe it is, uh, here's, here's what the psalmist uh, has to say. He says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. Anybody ever had oppression to hit you? Yeah, it's, it's horrible, isn't it? He will be a refuge. I found that to be true in my life. He's a refuge when I have been oppressed. He is also a refuge in time of trouble. Now, what does the Bible say in, in the New Testament concerning Jesus? Well, in the book of uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 38, Peter was talking about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all, all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Praise God. We have a place to run to in time of trouble. Praise God. Now, healing the oppressed. You know, so I'm starting out with giving you some positive here. Positiveness. Now, people search for these things in their lives. I, I'm convinced unbelievers in God search for these things. They want security. They want safety. They want a place of rest. They want all these things in their lives. But here's the catch to it all. Some find it and some don't. Some find it and some don't. You'll never find it outside of Jesus. I'll tell you that right now. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, let's take a look at this other part of 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. Where he says that the weapons that we have to use are given by God. Same as his armor is God's armor. He gives it to us. These weapons that God gives us are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, not ever stronghold is a good one. Some strongholds need to be pulled down and ridded out of your lives. Now the thing of it is, God is a stronghold. We just had scriptures to prove that. But keep this in mind, church, that Satan has counterfeits for all of God's goodness. You know what evil is? It's a perversion of good. You know what a lie is? A lie is the truth perverted. You know what fear is? It's faith perverted. And what's the source of all of these perversions? Satan. God did everything good. God made no evil things. He did it right to start with. It was Satan that came along and perverted all of these things. Now, here's the thing. And we studied a little bit on this previously. About uh, these carnal things and things that he puts in there. Satan wants you to put your trust in carnal things. Fleshly things, things that you can see, things that you can touch, things that you... These things are your enemies. Satan wants to make you believe they are your friend. 
He'll make you feel highly exalted in yourself because you deserve it. He'll do a lot of things through the flesh just to make you feel good in your flesh. But it's a trap of the devil. I want you to hear it. They are your enemies. Verse 5, same chapter 10, says this. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's the Word of God. And then you bring into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. It starts, these strongholds of Satan starts with thoughts. That's what Paul said here, first thing right off. He said, casting down imaginations, thoughts, will get you into trouble. Or a good thought can get you out of trouble. Amen? You need to understand, you know, where thoughts can come from. You may be a genius, I understand, but not every thought that comes to you may be of your own making. Because Satan can put thoughts in your mind. He uses, as the old saying is, the mind is the devil's playground. And I found that to be the case. He'll drive a thought. He'll drive an idea. Boy, wasn't that a good idea of mine. Well, <laughs> um, but you know, I heard one time of some of these people that was sitting around doing some kind of a seance or whatever, you know, mind religion, mind religion. And the leader of the group, a guru or something like that, said, you know, I think it would all be a, a beneficial to us if we all just laid back and just relaxed and just emptied ourselves out of everything within us. So they all joined in. And here they were sitting around just breathing, emptying themselves out. And finally they kind of come back to their own senses. And this guru said, wasn't that a great idea of mine? <laughs> If you didn't get it, think on it. You'll get it later. What did he empty himself? Sure wasn't himself. <laughs> he still wanted to take the glory. See? But ideas, thoughts, reasonings. Well, it makes sense to me. But does it make sense to God? You see? Amen? Philosophies. That gets deep. Now, now, here's the thing. I want us to go back here to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, let's, let's look here at verse 20. 1 Corinthians 3 and 20 says this. And again, Paul says, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise. The Lord knows your thoughts, even wise people. But you know what? The Lord knows that the thoughts of a wise man are what? Vain. Vain. You know what the flesh wants? Vain glory. Vainness, vainness, vainness. So he said in verse 21, Let therefore no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Amen? So, Satan uses, that's what he's talking about. Keep in mind here, uh, in verse 5, these man-made arguments. Those are arguments, by the way. Imaginations. Every high thing exalting itself against the knowledge of God. These man-made arguments. I'm going to tell you something to help you right here if you're listening. He'll use man-made arguments to build up a wall inside of your spirit that is a wall against truth. Do I need to say that again? He'll use his arguments 
inside of you to build up that wall against truth. And that's the reason you'll find people. I tell people that God is good and God wants to save them and the way of living the Christian life is the best way. But yet people will say, well, but I know of this and I know of that. What is it? Satan has built a stronghold in their lives to resist the truth. There's your stronghold. There's the stronghold that needs to come down. Mm. Wow. Now, believing Satan's lies, every stronghold is a deception of Satan. It's built upon nothing but lies. And it results in people trusting in themselves. If I build up a resistance inside of me and me alone, then I'm going to be able to resist all evil. No, they have built up a resistance based upon a lie of Satan, and that lie is an evil stronghold in their lives. If I'll just learn to eat and drink and be merry, I'll be the happiest person around. Another lie, right? Right? Amen? So you see there, I could go in more of this, but I won't, but I want to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here. Now, there are emotional strongholds. I suppose every one of us have experienced some of them. Emotional feelings. When you get a thought... That's one thing. You can do that thought whatever you want to. You can cast it away. You can entertain it. Or you can get rid of it. As the old saying is, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep him from building a nest in your hair. Right? So an emotion and a thought is where it becomes a problem here. A thought's one thing, but if you let that thought become an emotion or a feeling inside of you, then that thought, whether it's good or whether it's bad, is a stronghold. That's right. Nod your head right. That's true. Now, negative thoughts, stronghold of the enemy. Amen? Amen? What about guilt? Mm. Digging deep now, ain't it? What about shame? What about regret? Wow. I can check some of them, can't you? You, you know what I have a problem with? We can all identify, I think, with some of those things. Even worry. I've told you before, I was a world champion warrior. I didn't say warrior, I said warrior. <laughs> Amen. I could worry with the best of them. I'd worry if I didn't have anything to worry about just because I didn't have anything to worry about. Now that's bad. But worry is an emotional thing of where Satan is building a stronghold in a person's life. Think about it. You know, there's some people that almost seem, and, and we're talking about guilt and shame there, you know, I mentioned those things, and negative thoughts, but some people uh, act like they're almost proud of the life they lived before they come to Jesus. And you know what I say? Shame on you. You're doing, you're doing despite to the blood of Jesus if you said, boy, I was a good guy and then I got saved and become a... No, no, no. Flat out doesn't work that way. So the devil plays mind games. He wants to get your thought, thoughts in your head and then from there he builds on and on with his feelings and emotions which are what? Carnal. You hear me? Carnal. Okay, yeah. to destroy, that's what we need to get to, and that's what I felt like I need to deal with just for a little while this morning. 
to overthrow and destroy these strongholds. I want to say it again. These kind of strongholds are false refuges. They are false securities. You may think they're working, but they're not. They're false. Against these that needs to be pulled down, according to the word there, or destroyed or overthrown, God has given us mighty spiritual weapons. Mighty spiritual weapons to destroy them. Now, uh, what did we talk about for a little while there uh, a couple of weeks ago? Talked about one of these, which it got started out. Uh, I brought up one of the most powerful. One of the most powerful weapons is, is what you have right there in this Holy Bible and what can come out of your mouth, which is the Word of God. The Word of God. Jesus used it there in the wilderness, in the temptation. He said, when Satan tempted him, he said, it is written. It is written. It is written. And therefore, the Word of God becomes what? It becomes the sword of the Spirit. So I'm here to encourage you this morning. If you have a problem, you have trouble, as the Bible says, you need somewhere to go to, take the Word of God, speak it with confidence. Speak it with confidence. Somebody said, well, my confidence level is pretty low right now. It doesn't matter if you're down here, start speaking the Word of God and your confidence level. Woo. This is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. He hears us. That's the petitions He desires from us. Amen. Hallelujah. We speak the Word with confidence. This is the one I want to talk to you to close the message this morning. Another weapon that is so powerful. I dare say, none of us understand how great it is. That's prayer. Wow. You mean, Brother David, just plain old prayer? <laughs> prayer. Amen? The power of prayer. I'm not sure... If anybody has ever figured out how powerful prayer is meant to be. Now, in, in the book of Ephesians where it talks about the armor of God, it, it tells us there, uh, the Apostle Paul at the end there, he talks about praying always with all manner of prayer with all kinds of prayer, I could say, all kinds of prayer, praying how? In the Spirit. When you get a Spirit-filled person praying, you're touching heaven. Let me tell you something. We need to believe in prayer. I mean, believe in prayer. You know what happens when you pray? Jesus said to pray. Paul said to pray. The Bible tells us to pray. We get God involved in our lives. If we don't pray, we don't have God involved. So get your little list. I'm going to start praying more right now. Because I want God involved in my life. Jesus said, you know, if you ask not, you receive not. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, where's God obligated to do things for you if you don't ask Him? If you don't pray? Amen? Prayer. Think about it. The powerful weapon of prayer. And let me tell you something else. I'm convinced of this, that if you look at all of the pieces of the armor of God in the same chapter, we won't go into it this morning, but you're going to find helmet of salvation, feet shod, shield of faith, all of these things that we are to put on to fight with, by the way, to stand with, you're going to find out that prayer is designed and made to touch every spiritual weapon. Every part of that armor is touched by prayer. Man? If you want your armor to shine bright, you need to polish it with prayer. Amen? Isn't that a good revelation? Keep my armor bright. Amen? The old song says. So we polish our armor with prayer. The shield of faith, prayer again. Every spiritual weapon. It it doesn't matter. I don't know if we'll go into any more of these or not. But let me tell you something. You could use the name of Jesus... Powerful. But you know what makes it work? Prayer. Prayer. Even speaking the word. Prayer. Prayer works. Amen. Now. Examples. Yeah, I've got time for a couple of examples, don't I? Example here. Go with me to the book of James, if you would. James chapter 5, or yeah, chapter 5. I I want us to look in verse 16. And it says here, Confess your faults one to another and pray, pray one for another, that you may be healed. All right? Because, listen to this, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The example James gave gave was the prophet Elijah. He said in verse 17, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Then the Bible says he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Tell you what, that's powerful praying. That's powerful praying, church. Now, if you go over there in the Old Testament, 1 Kings, and where Elijah appeared on the scene. It didn't give a a long chapter or two of endorsement of what Elijah was. He just showed up there in the 17th chapter and he went straight to King Ahab and he said, you know, it ain't going to rain again till I say it's going to rain. Wow. That's powerful. He had a war to fight because Ahab and all his wickedness was destroying God's people. This is war. Amen. So he took it to... And drastic measures take drastic actions. And and a drought of three and a half years was on the horizon, folks. To get people's attention. To get their attention. But he prayed and he prayed again. And let me tell you something else. Elijah's prayer was specific. Pinpointed. Hear me, king. It ain't going to rain. It ain't going to rain right now until I say it's going to rain. 
Now, pinpointed. In our prayer lives, I've been guilty of this. I don't know. Maybe you've never. Sometimes I get a little too generalized in my prayer. You ever get too generalized? Sometimes I wonder, even God may not know where to hook on to that to start to answer your prayer. We can cover, we can cover things that goes all the way around the world in a little old short prayer. Isn't that amazing? But we never really identify a specific cause sometimes. Have you ever done that? So God spoke to my heart and said, you better get more specific if you want me to answer your prayers. Amen. <laughs> During the Persian Gulf War, Saddam Hussein had these missiles, Scud missiles. They were notorious for being inaccurate. Shoot one of them off. Who knows where they was going to land? They weren't pinpointed. You remember in, in that period of time, there was a news service called CNN that was over there in Persian Gulf. Boy, they were doing live broadcasts. They was keeping everybody that had a TV updated on what was going on in that war. I guess they're doing a pretty good job. Wolf Blitzer and all of them really hanging right in there, keeping us all updated. You know what Saddam Hussein did? He tuned in to CNN. You know why? To find out where his missiles landed. <laughs> I just find that a little bit funny. I know it's not, but he wanted to find out where his missiles were going because he had no idea. Sometimes I wonder <laughs> if we really know where our prayers are going. I mean, Elias was specific. Amen? Now, the, the United States and America's coalition and all, we had Tomahawk missiles and we had uh, the Patriot uh, Defensive missiles and all those. Now, I understand they were far more accurate. And you know what? They were far more effective. Right? That was warfare. We're in the same kind of warfare spiritually as those in the Persian Gulf against Saddam Hussein. So, Accuracy is important in warfare, as well as a lot of other things. Oh, one other thing. Time's a ticking, and the eclipse is on its way. <laughs> you thought I'd forgot, didn't you? You was hoping I'd forgot, didn't you? Can I make one more point before I close? You know, eclipses have happened before. They really have. And actually, they can be scientifically explained. Isn't that something? Eclipse can be. They can predict it. And as far as I know, they can pretty well hit it. I guess this time tomorrow, people will be already getting ready to watch it if it's in their path. I want to give you one more example. of a war strategy. Now this is a war strategy. Amen. The book of Joshua, chapter 10, if you'd like to go there with me. Joshua was battling, fighting against the Amorites, God's enemy, Israel's enemy. And in the book of Joshua chapter 10, and we go down to verse 12, we know 
before that, even God had sent hailstones from heaven that smote the Amalekites. And they were getting victory. But, but listen to this. Verse 12, Joshua 10. Then, even though it looked like the battle was going in Joshua's favor, but then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day. Do you know what it means when the Bible says, and Joshua spake to the Lord? That means he was praying. <laughs> Amen. Did you know talking to God is praying? So we can say here, Joshua spake to the Lord when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And here's what Joshua said in the sight of all of Israel. He had already talked to God about it. Son, <laughs> S-U-N. Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. This was written in the book of Jasher. And the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. Can you imagine what it would do if that happened now? <laughs> Can you really imagine? I mean, yeah, we can explain away an eclipse, but how about the sun? I can see the scientists already. The earth has stopped rotating. You know what that means, don't you? Huh? Or the sun's going backwards. <laughs> oh, the sky's falling. <laughs> oh, that would... Now, okay, let, 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 me, let me ease, ease your concerns right now. I do believe this was a one-time occurrence because, listen to this, uh, verse 14, and there was no day like this day. This was a double day. It stayed daylight basically two days. A double day. And there was no day like it before that. And the Bible says nor after that, so whew, don't have to worry about that, do we? And you don't even have to worry about the world being destroyed by flood anymore. Beware of the fire, little. Amen. I got Bible on those. And it says that the Lord hearkened unto the voice, listen to me, the voice of a man named Joshua. For the Lord fought for Israel. God is a miracle working God. It started at the beginning. It's going on now. It's going on till the end of time. God does great and mighty miracles. Wow. Mm. You ready to let God be God? Let God be God. Amen. Okay, one more scripture. No, I went a little over, but Anyway, let me, let me go, with you, uh, go with me to the book of St. Matthew, chapter 12. And here's what Jesus had to say. Because some people were getting confused about who He was and what He was doing here on this earth and casting out devils and all of these things. But listen, this scripture right here, and then I'll close. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 29, Jesus said this, How else or how can one enter into a strong man's house? Brother David, I've got strongholds in my life. 
Do you know who the strong man is right there? The first strong man is Satan. How can I? I have thought depressions. I have thought oppressions. I have thought guilt. I have thought shame. I have thought all these things. I don't know how to deal with them. If you try to enter in on your own against that strong man, Jesus is saying, you cannot spoil his goods. You follow me? You cannot do it. Except you must first bind that strong man and then you can spoil his house. 